Hey, man, we give God praise uh, for this opportunity uh, just to honor him. And I didn't know Jason was going to make me cry uh, before I got up to share God's word. But I do honor uh, my colleagues uh, in the ministry who are here, uh, especially those who shared with us uh, prior to me. Matthew, you did an awesome job. Uh, Tiffany, you did as well. And so I thank God for being a part of your preaching circle and for how you will sharpen me uh, over the next couple of days. I can say, uh, honestly, uh, that over the last two days, I've been simultaneously inspired and intimidated uh, that there are many great preachers who are here, and I'm just glad to be in the number. Amen? Amen. If you have your word, turn me to the book of Acts, chapter 1. Acts, chapter 1. Acts, chapter 1. Tiffany already read my text, but I'll do <laughs> due, due diligence and read it again. And we'll read here from Acts, chapter 1, verse 6 through 11. The word of the Lord says in the New King James Version, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. And so I just want to preach for the next few minutes from my overall theme, the gospel and the city, with this subtitle, A Panacea for Every Problem. Wow. A panacea for every problem. Let us pray. Father and God, we honor you and we thank you so much for this opportunity to share your word one with another. And we are humbled by the presence of your spirit that is in this place, that is manifested through the manifold gifts, of the many preachers that you brought to this ecumenical setting. God, we thank you for how you just built up the body of Christ and how you have prepared us to be faithful over this generation and sharing the gospel in every city. Pray, God, that your name will be magnified, that these, your people, would be edified, and that no flesh would glory in your presence. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. The panacea for every problem. Uh, despite how old I get, I will never forget the day as a child where I ran into a pole head first, full speed. No doubt those around me laughed in chorus and in unison as I plummeted to the ground. For some reason, this pole that had been there every day all of a sudden popped up out of nowhere. And once I stood to my feet and regained my balance, I ran home to tell my mom of what had happened. She could see the knot on my head, and it was as if I looked up at the knot and it looked back down at me. <laughs> and she responded to me the same way she did with my three previous fractured ankles, and she said, put some ice on it. This was my mom's initial response for every injury, everything that was swollen, everything that was broken, everything that was hurting, her response was put some ice on it. In essence, ice was her panacea for every problem. And the older I grew, I started to doubt, I started to wonder if what my mom called a panacea was really a placebo, and if she was trying to trick me to make me think that it was working when in actuality it wasn't working. But the older I get, and I had a few bumps and bruises as an adult, and I've realized, I've come to accept as truth that ice indeed is a panacea for all pain. The other day, it came full circle for me. My wife and I were sitting in the living room with her cousin, and our oldest son ran into the room with a lump on the side of his head. And it was at that moment when my homiletic mind kicked into gear, and I could see God making the connection. Now it was my time to apply to him what was applied to me, that the same remedy that worked for me, now it was my time to administer to him so it could work for him as well. And in essence, that's what Christ is saying to his disciples. He's saying, look, you found a remedy in me that you've applied to your life. Now I'm going to commission you to go to the world and apply me to every city that you come into. And it's here in Acts chapter 1 where Luke details in his second account to the most excellent Theophilus of the account of the ascension of our Christ. But before Christ ascends back to heaven, he commissions his disciple to proclaim his gospel in every city. And just like he told him that then, 2,000 years later, Christ has called us to preach his gospel in every city. And as it relates to us being faithful over this task of preaching the gospel, the first thing we see in this text is the authority over the times. So watch this, verse 6 and 7. The disciples are inquisitive about the timing of the fulfillment of God's promise to Israel. In response, you notice Jesus never says yes or no. All he says is that God is in control of the times. Yeah. 
the disciples are worried about world supremacy, but God has better things in store for them. They're concerned about what God is going to do for them when he's thinking about what he wants to do through them. Their request wasn't wrong. It just wasn't time. God's plan to saturate the world with the gospel is what he authorized for these times. And the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3.11, he has made everything beautiful in his time. And if it's time for the gospel, that means it's time out for fake, phony believers who are so self-centered where we're more concerned about what God wants to do for us as opposed to what God wants to do through us. And when I really consider the disciples' preoccupation with this premature blessing, it reminds me of my toddler son. My two-year-old this morning at 8 o'clock in the morning got into our truck as we prepared to take him from home to school, and he said, Daddy, can I have some candy? What he doesn't know is that your request is okay, but it's not time for candy. It's 8 o'clock in the morning. And being your father, I have more knowledge of the times and what's appropriate for you now. And I have prepared eggs and grits and frosted flakes for you to consume at 8 o'clock in the morning. And when time is appropriate, you will get the candy. And what I love about these young preachers is that oftentimes we can become anxious about when it'll be our time to be the senior pastor. When is it going to be my time to get all of the invitations? When is it going to be my time to fly across the country and preach God? God's word and what he's telling us is your request is okay but it's just not time as we made our turn onto Fulton Industrial we passed by McDonald's and I can admit that the golden arches caused my stomach to rumble as well and my two year old said daddy can I have some fries watch this it's 8 o'clock in the morning they don't start making fries to 10 30 it's nothing wrong with your request it's just not time in other words the thing you're asking for God for is just not ready he's preparing you for what he has prepared for you so you have to recognize that number one God has authority over the times and as a result of that, we need his anointing for the task. This is so amazing. Verse 8, he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. In an ecumenical setting of this sort, I know there are many connotations for the word anointing. But for the sake of my point, let me give you one unifying definition for anointing. In the words of my pastor, my preaching mentor, Pastor Craig Oliver, he would say that the anointing of God is the enabling power of God on you to do in and through you what you inerrantly cannot do yourself. In other words, God's anointing is when he put his super on your natural, his extra on your ordinary, his jelly on your peanut butter, his butter on your popcorn to do through you with him what you can't do without him. Can anybody testify? I thank God for his anointing. And in this text, we see that these disciples are indeed anointed, but they're not just anointed. They're also spirit filled. And I really believe that the indictment on many of us young preachers is that we've settled for being anointed and haven't sought to be spirit filled. What's the difference? Anointing is what God puts on me to accomplish an assignment. Filling is what God puts in me as a result of my obedience. Don't miss it. The anointing is the gifts God gives me without repentance. The filling is what God puts in me that's contingent upon my obedience to his commands. In other words, to the degree that I obey God, I am filled with his spirit. If I obey God a little, I'm filled a little. If I obey God a lot, I'm filled a lot. In other words, we should not just settle for having it on us. We should want to have it in us. Why? Because you can be anointed to preach and living like hell from Monday to Saturday. Well, if when you preach, it is dynamic, but when you live, you look like the devil, then you are anointed, but not spirit filled. Come in, David. You remember in 2 Samuel chapter 11, Dave, David was anointed king of Israel, but he was not filled with God's spirit when he saw Bathsheba baby. Okay, okay. Here in the South, we have this uh, donut restaurant that really adds color to our culture, namely Krispy Kreme. Let the church say amen. Amen, amen. Have you ever been driving down the street minding your own business? You just ate. You are full, and you see a Krispy Kreme. Right when you pass by it, the hot sound comes on. You say to yourself, yes, Lord, to your will, and yes to your way. You turn the corner, you enter the parking lot of Krispy Kreme. When you go into Krispy Kreme, you have two choices. You can get the original glazed donut, or you can get the jelly-filled donut. Now, both of these have something on them, but only one has something in it. Because only one has the capacity to house the jelly. What's the difference? The original glazed donut has no capacity to house something in it because there's a hole in the middle. Whereas the jelly has increased its capacity, so now it can be filled. What's the point? When your character has holes, you are not whole. Preach all. I already am. In other words, you should want to have the frosting on you and the jelly in you. Is there anybody who can testify? Lord, increase my capacity by obeying your commands so I won't just have the 
anointing on me. I want the spirit in me. Yeah. And he says in his text that God has the authority over the times. He's anointing us for the task. Yeah. Number three, he's given us an assignment to testify. Yeah. Verse eight says that the disciples are now going to be his witnesses. Yeah. Notice he qualifies what type of witnesses. He doesn't say you're going to be witnesses. He says, you shall be witnesses, here it is, of me. Yeah. All right. They knew what to witness because they knew him. Yeah. If you don't know the me in verse eight, you cannot be the witness in verse eight. Well, you can only testify of Christ what you personally experience with Christ. And if we're going to be effective witnesses, young preachers, for Christ in 2013, it's going to take more than oratorical eloquence, infectious personalities, and, cemetery tra and seminary training. We must have personal experiences with God that truly testify about him. And the truth of the matter is the power of a witness cannot be overstated. Why? Because with every catastrophe, with every massacre, with every natural disaster, the atheists and agnostics of our postmodern world put the God of creation on trial. And if the God of creation on trial, surely the defense attorney is going to call a few witnesses to the stand. Come here, Abraham. Abraham can be a witness that God keeps his promise. Come here, Joshua. Joshua can be a witness that God will fight your battles. Come here, Ruth. Ruth can be a witness that God will comfort those who mourn. Come here, Esther. Esther can be a witness that God will exalt you for his glory. Come here, Amos. Amos can testify that the significance of your ministry is not determined on where you come from, but on the magnitude of your God. And once we have exhausted the heroes and heroines of scripture, you can put me on the I promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. I am a witness of what God can do through a young boy that was born to a 15-year-old mother and a 19-year-old father raised in a single-parent home in the inner city projects of Atlanta, Georgia. Can anybody testify? I've had some experience with God that I can be a witness of God's goodness. You see in this text, the authority over the times, that we've been anointed for the task. We've given the assignment to testify, number four, check out the advancement of truth. Verse 8, he says, in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. In other words, he's saying the gospel will proliferate in circles out. He says, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. Think about what Christ is saying. His statement does not just explicate that the gospel must be preached in these places, but it implicates that it will be preached successfully. Yeah. Inferred in the command is the fact that the gospel will make it to the ends of the earth. Nothing in Jerusalem will stop the gospel from infiltrating Judea. Nothing in Judea will stop the gospel from intruding Samaria. Nothing in Samaria will stop the gospel from influencing the world. Yes. And the reason our modern cities remain sick and with sin is because believers have forgotten that we are not to be fearful, but we are to be feared. Yeah. When we take the gospel to the city, nothing can stop us from advancing the work of Christ. Matter of fact, Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We see the authority of the times that he's anointed us for the task giving us the assignment to testify. Indeed, we shall advance his truth. But here's the shouting part, the anticipation of triumph. Don't miss it. The disciples watched Jesus go up into heaven. Then two guys dressed in white say the same way he went up, it's the same way he's coming back down. The anticipated return of Christ is the ultimate mark of victory for those who share the gospel. The sound of the trumpet will spell ultimate victory for all believers. We shall have victory over the power of sin, which is temptation, the presence of sin, which is this world, and the penalty of sin, which is death, hell, and the grave. Keep preaching the gospel, young preachers. Why? Because our cities need it to shield them from this world until the sirens of heaven signal the appearing of the Savior to deliver us in victory. I'm gone, young preachers. Thank God for your time. But before I go, remember I told you that when I used to hurt myself, my mama would say, put some ice on it. On. And just as ice is a cure-all for the physical hurts we have, the gospel is a panacea for every problem in every city. Yeah. The world walks around with swollen knots on their head wow. that are symptomatic of collisions with high crime rates, with social injustices, with widespread hunger. Instead of telling them to put some ice on it, we need to tell them to put some Christ on it. Preach all. I knew that ice would help my son's knot because ice helped my knot. 
I know that Jesus can heal your pain because Jesus healed my pain. I know that the gospel will work for you because the gospel will work for me. And the same panacea that healed all my problems is the same panacea that healed all your problems. So young preachers, when you go back home to Milwaukee and Boston and Los Angeles and New York, take the gospel with you. When you go back home to these hurting cities, don't tell them put some ice on it. Tell them put some Christ on it. And I dare you, take a plane overseas. Go to cities like Tokyo and Cairo and Dubai and Hong Kong and tell them that Christ is the ice that will heal all your pain. Hallelujah.